All right, here we are. Symposium, another of the dialogues of Socrates. So what are your guys' first impression after reading it? I found this one was really interesting. Um, it's funny because we're reading a symposium and having a symposium on it, right? And the format of discussion is, is really interesting, being able to, to see these different perspectives. I think it's the god Eros that they're discussing, the god of love, right? And uh, it, it's almost like this intellectual party and the pastime and the entertainment is intellectual discussion, which is such a nice uh, breath of fresh air compared to the party scenes that I've been involved in. That, that would be my first impression. Yeah, I was really interested in the point that the uh, narrator of the story is Apollodorus, but he tells the story from the point of view of Aristodemus, who was actually at the symposium, and yet the entire book that we're reading is written by a, another person named Plato. So this has been three times removed from the original source. Yeah, there are many different perspectives on the concept of love. It kind of reminded me of the whole nature versus grace perspective. Mm. I'm not familiar with that. Would you be able to expand on that a little bit? Well, the, well, the entire book talks about the concept of love. Where does it come from? And how does one live with love? How does one obtain love? I know one of them says that in order to obtain love, you have to achieve happiness. And another one talks about the origins of how love is conceived from the soul, I would say. It's kind of a spiritual thing. And it's like finding your other half, your other self, the other half of yourself in the world, and striving to connect with it. But in this sense, uh, it reminded me so much of nature and grace that you have to figure out what you mean by love your own definition of love and i guess go out into the world and find out how much of that you can take in and then eventually you'll find your ultimate answer towards love i i don't know if that makes sense yeah, yeah no, I, I hear where you're coming from and then there's the other aspect of like when they're trying to just define love and the origins of it and Socrates has the criticism that like you talk about love in a way that's just you pick out all the good things of life and then you attach the label love to it to say oh this is the work of the god love but when, when we finally get to Socrates he he really tries to discover what love is as opposed to just the good and the beautiful and the fair. Yeah, it's like adding different layers. You start off by moving towards a certain type of beauty that starts off with the body, and then it becomes two bodies, and then it becomes multiple bodies, and then eventually you move towards different pursuits and different occupations that you find beautiful whether it's nature whether it's science whether it's engineering whether it's mathematics you learn the basis of science all the basics of it until you finally arrive to a unique type of beauty that no other beauty can establish and ultimately when you get older, it seems as if that your soul grows, that, that kind of love grows within you as you age. That's what I got out of it. I think, um, yeah, like going on that thread, I, I really like <clears throat> the way Socrates talks about love. I mean, screw everybody else's opinion. I was just waiting for my boy to pipe up. And he, he says, um, he, he starts like, 
I don't know, needling Agathon, right? Because I think Agathon was the one who spoke before him, and he kind of just like needles the person that spoke before him to yeah. to kind of establish the stage on which he'll he'll speak, and then he says, after hashing it all out, that uh, he desires that uh, that what he has at present may be preserved to him in the future, which is equivalent to saying that he desires something which is non-existent to him and which as yet he has not got. And he talks about preserving what we like in the future and not that we're happy with what we have, but that we'll be happy having what we have forevermore and I guess at, at first, you know, you need to find out what it is that you want, but once you have it, it's it's not having it that makes you happy. It's continuing to have it that makes you happy. And that is a really interesting dichotomy that I hadn't really considered until reading this was that, no, it's not, about, it's not about being happy with what you have. It's making sure that you still have what you have that makes you happy tomorrow and doing everything in your power to preserve those things that you have that you like and, and get rid of those things that you have that you don't like. It's yeah, really interesting. exactly. I love that metaphor so much that it's not even that you're preserving what you have. It's that you're working towards attaining, like if you're already strong, you're working towards attaining strength for your future self, not just getting stronger. You, you're working towards a future. Yeah. It's really cool. I, I really enjoyed the way Socrates comes in. He, he wasn't so much of a prick in Symposium as he was in Carmides. He was more to the point in this discussion, and he really brought something to the table that I, I really, really liked. It resonated with me a lot. Yeah, and it worked out really nice after we got all these other people trying to define love in a different way or worship love in a different way. And then we get the Socratic method shining brightly through all of them. Also, it reminds me of something that Truman Capote once said. I don't know if he said it in an interview or he mentioned it in his book, Breakfast at Tiffany's, but he talks about finding real beauty in an era where beauty becomes artificial where people want to become the best of themselves by putting on a mask or putting on makeup because it's the next big trend. But true beauty, according to what some people say when they establish this artificial beauty, is not egalitarian enough. And I got that kind of... I got that thought while reading this as well when Socrates stepped in says you have to find true beauty out there instead of just making this forced this forced trend of what you think love is yeah it's an, it's an interesting okay. book to discuss you know because there's like i think we dove right to the point right away and now i'm just kind of saying inside myself what what more is there to say other than how smart socrates is <laughs> Well, uh, I had one thing that I wanted to bring up. It was during the the Phaedra speech when he brings up the comparisons the comparison of Alcestis and Orpheus, which I thought was pretty interesting. Cuz like a uh, Alcestis Which one was that? It was it was the first speech by Phaedra. He talks about like the Alcestis myth who died for her husband and was later resurrected by Hercules or, you know, whatever else. There's a couple right. of different versions of the myth. And then there, they talk, he talks about Orpheus in comparison, about how he goes to the underworld and fails because, you know, that, that, that wasn't true love. He was just trying to conquer death in a way. I'm not sure. But that also kind of reminded me of another Norse myth, about Loki and Loki's wife because there's a there's a point before Ragnarok where all the Norse gods kidnap Loki and they punish him for his crimes and they put him under a cave like chained to rocks and stuff and there's like a drip of venom 
constantly on his face and then his wife's there and he's just like what are you going to do with me right and Thor or someone's just like you, you're free to go you're not being punished but she's like sitting there with this big bowl that they told her to bring for some reason and she voluntarily holds the bowl in front of Loki's face to catch all the venom as it drips so I thought that was a pretty good myth pertaining to love to compare to Alcestis or Orpheus Okay, yeah, that's, that is interesting. I'll have to read that one. But it definitely talks about, like, sacrifice and selflessness, right? The, mm -hmm. the loving actions. Loving actions and selflessness almost have to go hand in hand, that you can't just be prideful and try to conquer the world and, and get beauty. That that doesn't lead to any sort of real reward. It, it, it's got to be this act uh, that's true to your nature, yeah. And uh, you, you sacrifice this darker part of you. And that's why and Orpheus failed. That's why Orpheus failed, because at the last moment he had to look back to make sure that the, the woman he was rescuing, his lost love, was still following him. He, he couldn't trust in her, and he just had to make sure. And it, he, couldn't, he couldn't go the whole way without seeing her. He couldn't make that sacrifice, so he failed. Whereas right. Alcestis completely laid down her life, said, I will die so my love can live. And then for that act of love, she was given a resurrection by the hands of Hercules. Right. And in the Loki myth, you have like this woman who's just, yep, you're, you're free to go entirely. You can just leave and we'll leave you alone. But she damns herself to be the person that, you know, just saves Loki a little bit of pain. And it also goes over every yeah. time that bowl that she's carrying fills up, she has to empty it out. And every time she moves the bowl to empty it out, the drips of venom that hit Loki's face cause him to squirm and scream and cry so hard that that's where earthquakes come from. And then the bull goes really? back over, and then, yeah, that's that's how the Norse explained earthquakes. It's pretty cool. That's crazy. That's And you got to speculate as to what would have happened to Loki's wife had she not held the bull, you know? And obviously, it's, it's quite obvious, right? Like, if that's the cause of earthquakes, if she had have been prideful and said, okay, well, I'm free to go, I'll just leave Loki here to suffer, it would have caused the destruction of of an entire planet. Yeah. At the same time, it's not the drive to save the planet. It's it's a drive to, you know, um, ease the the wounds and the suffering of her lover Loki. So, I think that's a really cool metaphor because the action of selfless love for Loki does lead to saving the planet. It it's not because she's saving the planet that she stays, but that her selfless acts have this magnificent. Uh, repercussion. That's beautiful. It's interesting. Love will save yeah. the world. Absolutely. That's the point, right? Selfless acts that have no lofty expectations of, of return on investment do end up having the highest return on investment. What did you guys think of the uh, articulation by Pausinius and Eryximachus about the two different forms of love because Pausinius has a quote that says uh, evil is the vulgar lover who loves the body rather than the soul where is Eryximachus how do you even pronounce it Eryximachus he, he just kind of expands on that and says that uh, the latter form is, is diseased and one form is divine so there's a there's a divine form of love and a diseased form of love. Right. Can you repeat the quote one more time? Pisinius says, Evil is the vulgar lover who loves the body rather than the soul. And then he goes on to talk about, you know, the old guys that, you know, love the young boys for their minds and, you know, nurture them and those who just love the young boys for their bodies and then scurries away. It's like how love the body is less 
than the love of the mind. Because there's another quote in there that's um, that is actually, I really like it, but uh, it, I'm just paraphrasing here. And it goes like, as soon as the body fades away, he flies and ends up betraying all promises and speeches when he fades away. It's, it's kind of like, yeah. And meanwhile, the other one is one who loves the soul, is in love with his own life because he adheres to it. Was that, was that his own um, version of, of love or was that somebody else? Yeah, I think that was uh, Eryximachus that went into that kind of stuff. Okay. Because he was talking about the divinity of love and how, like, Eryximachus was the physician, right? He's the one that, uh, the doctor. So he, mm-hmm. made the, he made the comparison of to heal someone with love, you'd have to use the divine love and implant the divine love inside of them and remove the source of the diseased form of love. So if he's just like an adulterer, then he's got an affliction that you need to cure with the divine form of love instead of the diseased. So he kind of analyzes it like an illness. Yeah, I actually, I really did like the way he spoke about it, the whole fostering of the good parts of love and shying away from those foul parts or converting them into something greater that someone who has these issues simply needs it again it talks about temperance right to to become more temperate and and foster the the whole and and the the good inside them and implant more love inside them is that to heal the body yeah and talks a lot about music as well yeah i was just going to bring that up he makes the metaphor of harmony and a a symphony so like an arrangement of different musical instruments playing different lines of music different scores of music but they all work together in a it's an agreement of disagreements i think he says something like that yeah that to have that symphony all the parts have to be in agreement while disagreeing, but not actively disagreeing, and yeah. talks about resonation, right? They have to be individuals in accordance with one another instead of just, you know, doing the same thing. Then you just have, you know, a flute and a lyre playing the exact same music and not adding anything to the actual symphony. Just as much as if you had someone playing an instrument trying to show off and get the attention. If everyone was trying to do that, that would be just a discord, right? There'd be no no symphony, no harmony with everyone each trying to be their own show. Exactly. So they have to disagree with each other, I think, but the disagreements can agree. <laughs> which is interesting because I think there's, there's layers to that metaphor that speak to the ego and the self, right? And it's all of these parts working inside ourselves to to actually get us towards what is good and right for us because it is all subjective there's no right way to live maybe there is a right way to live we certainly don't put much pressure on the individual to live a correct way but that there are ways that individuals can live that lead to more happiness more healthiness and um, a, a state of, of security and that when we lean too far one way to the ego and satisfying our most basic pleasures and needs and stray away from the self that is trying to do some good to their community, whether that's their family, their friends, their town, their world, whatever, like it, it has to be in balance. They're constantly disagreeing. The self wants to do good for others. The ego wants to satisfy the body. But there has to be a balance because when you starve one, it it leads to a, a, a frenzying of the other, I would say. Yes. I'm not saying don't do good all your life, but I am saying know what you need. You know, it, it's one thing to feed the homeless. It's another thing to starve yourself. You can't feed the homeless if you starve to death. 
Yeah, there's a looking after yourself and there's a altruistic way of looking at it and then there's a mean between the two which is a which is the greatest line to come out of this book yeah I'm not even sure where that came from who was it that said that the mean between the two it was during the Socrates part where uh, he's talking to Diotama he was like t Telling right. the story about how he was talking to Diotama. Right. And, uh, yeah, and he asked her a couple questions like, is it fair or foul? Is it good or evil? Is it knowledge? Is it ignorance? And the answer is, it's a mean between the two. And Socrates, confused, says, well, how can that be? And then Diotama answers, right opinion. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. Right opinion. What a construct. There's another quote after that little bit, too, that I'll, I'll just read out. There's a pretty long passage in here with uh, Socrates' conversation with Diotama. So Socrates says, What is love? Is he mortal? No. What then? As in the former instance, he is neither mortal nor immortal, but in a mean between the two. What is he, Diotama? Is he a great spirit? And like all spirits, he is intermediate between the divine and the mortal. And what, I, and what, I said, is his power? He interprets, she replied, between gods and men, conveying, taking across the gods and the prayers and sacrifices of men, and to men the commands and replies of the gods. He is the mediator who spans the chasm which divides them. And therefore in him all is bound together, and through him the arts of the prophet and the priest, their sacrifices and mysteries and charms, and all prophecy and incantation find their way, for God mingles not with man, but through love all intercourse and converse of God with man, whether awake or sleep, is carried on. So that's what I thought was the, the bread and butter of the Socrates conversation. Yeah, I really like that, that whole notion that the things that people love are the messages from God, that our attractions have some sort of divinity to them. Yes. Gosh, this was a bit drier of a podcast, wasn't it? I pretty much said what I to say. I guess we can wrap this one up. All right, boys, well, I'm going to head out, so. May the force be with you. We can talk. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. All right, bye. Peace out.